Here we are with session 10. We took a few minutes break and check and song are back with me and we're going to, we said we were going to try to get this, this uh, one about the indebtedness and the charge cards and related issues uh, in since twice now. We've been just about to start on that and then it was the end of that session. A couple of things we mentioned in our, in our little uh, break was one that um, the getting your house in order so that you are free of debts and uh, what's the purpose in all of that? Not only is it against the, the laws or rules in the overcoming process, and not only what is the purpose, but we need to realize that it applies most urgently and more directly to those that we're talking about as far as overcomers are concerned. Because those houses must be gotten in order, and they have to be gotten in order the right way, and the only way we know, or the best we can do of uh, trying to do them the right way is according to the instruction that we have received on, on what is the right way. So it's important to realize that the issue is a major issue for those who see themselves as beginning a major task in personal overcoming, trying to complete that task to the satisfaction of our Father's Kingdom before the end of the age, or certainly have it underway enough that we are safe in their hands and we're in certainly in their camp and not in the other camp. Uh, <clears throat> there was another point to that. Uh, who, uh, check? Is, well, it, uh, is it not leaving a mess behind? And how we take care of yes, it? it's, uh, that's a very important aspect of it too. We can't, it is improper for us to just say, well, I'm just going to walk out the door of my house. I'm going to pack my little suitcase and I'm just not going to worry about it. Uh, 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 who I owe this to and who I owe that to and uh, how to uh, take care of those issues. Even though the, the possibility exists that as you might be in the process of trying to quickly, because it's very important that if you go this way that you do it very, very quickly, and the possibility that exists that in spite of your effort not to leave a mess, that you might be forced to leave some, and that's different. But for you to intentionally choose to leave a mess and turn the responsibility over to others, that is not the proper way to do it. But if in the process you end up with no choice because the circumstances close in on you so quickly, then you have to do as you would in any circumstance uh, that you find yourself in that position. While you're trying to do what is right and the circumstance changes, then you say, well, then I have no choice. I, uh, I must accept this as, as what is right, and I'll do the best I can to proceed from here. Or seek help and say, this happened. What, what can I do? Uh, it didn't happen the way I thought it was going to be. Because it's true in the process of overcoming, as we've received the lessons that we need, it never is the way we thought it was going to be. It always is, is pretty traumatic, and it always takes a 90-degree turn that becomes a shock to us, and we have to adjust to it and accept it as, wow, that was just exactly the thing to help me take a bigger leap forward that I didn't anticipate. So we have to be prepared for that. And so remember that this lesson of being free of indebtedness and not leaving a mess behind does apply, or the first one certainly, more to those who are in the process of trying to overcome. And not leaving a mess, of course, would be only for those who are more specifically applied to those who are trying to overcome because they certainly would want to try to be more mature about it and not just careless about it, but seeking help and guidance in how to quickly sever those things without doing them in a wrong way. You know, it, one of the hardest things to do in this overcoming process is to take menial instruction, instruction that you think that you can handle yourself, and to seek that instruction from those who have done it before you. That's hard to make that adjustment. 
And yet if you, if you do this, if you take this step, if you become a student of overcoming and we become teachers for you, if these students become your teachers, at every step you will increasingly learn, goodness, I could have avoided this, I could have avoided that, if I had seeked some help. But each time you seek help, then comes the test of could I just have done it my way? Or is it best to look to our Father's kingdom and those who have been assigned the task of helping me? That in itself will put you to a test each time. And even the closer you get in, into your overcoming, you become a part, you become tested in ways that are pretty tough and pretty serious because then you, you want to play a significant role as a teacher or in the tasks that represent the kingdom of heaven, whether they assign you to them or that instruction is given or not. So those little illustrations that we used to read about of putty in their hands and the patience that is required and of wanting your will, not mine, they keep reappearing at times when we're unaware that it is our will that we seek, uh, thinking that this is just uh, uh, a step in full of fulfilling their will, and yet we will assume certain steps in fulfilling it that weren't a part of their will or our Father's will, and that changed. So we have to really, the rules are different, the whole world is different, the process is different, and the test is tremendous. We don't mean to frighten you with it, and yet, uh, because we, we certainly, it's just like it wouldn't work if your motivation was because we were trying to scare the heck out of you or having you, if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell. I mean, that, uh, that's childish. That's, that should be beneath you and certainly beneath us as teachers. We're trying to help you be objective about it. And these things don't apply to you if they don't speak to you. They really, and that's kind of hard to understand too. But if you would, if this isn't something you're to do, then it is improper for us to say that they apply to all. That doesn't mean that those who are not doing it are not, from our Father's eyes, sinning or doing things against Him, but we're not judging them. We, he hasn't assigned us to them. He's assigned us to those who say, I identify. I, this is what I know I must do. I know that you know things that I am turned on to that I must pursue. You know, the way it's designed to here at the end of the age and as far as our assignment in this task is concerned, it's, it's quite different than some of the motivation was 2,000 years ago. A lot of the followers were motivated by seeming miracles that, that uh, Jesus would do and the fishes and loaves feeding multitudes and water to wine and healing the blind and the sick and raising from the dead. And these things were, my goodness, they were all used to try to get help their, those young souls to look at, to this individual who was the vessel and say, what can I learn from you? But he soon began to realize that what they wanted for the most part was more miracles that they didn't really care about the information of overcoming and following him down the difficult task of overcoming the world and becoming a student and humbling themselves and going to our Father's kingdom according to the route that was given to him, a step at a time, day by day, and the way it was designed. So, But back to how it's different, we don't, we haven't been given any powers. We don't have any instruction to do any healing or any miracles or uh, even though I know that certainly the next level could do them in a snap through us if we are vessels of theirs because they can do just about anything they want to do just by putting the thought in motion and they could certainly do it with you or with these students or with us. It, we can't, we have more sense than to limit to them. But in a sense, at the end of the age, the test is even greater because no one's uh, whetting your appetite or giving you things that you could easily be motivated to at certain stages. So it's almost as if the kingdom of heaven is saying, well, here at the end of the age, you 
you should be beyond that. The, and also the road is a little tougher. If these souls have come back, who may have even been with him at that time, and they're coming back to complete what they must do, the road is tougher. It's harder to identify. It requires more effort on your part. It requires more thirst. It requires a stronger pump. It requires a more thorough cleansing, because if you're going to get to our Father's kingdom and be able to stay there and not need to return unless assigned, then the list is long and the requirements are stiff. Because you're going to take, if you have truly graduated, you're going to take a vehicle, like we've said before, wear a suit of clothes that doesn't even have the capacity to do a lot of things that humans have to do. Not that you would want to do them, but it has also many, many things and capacities and functions to do, as we've talked about in mental communication and the missing of certain organs and certain capabilities to do things that we don't want to try to entice you by saying that you could appear or disappear or that you could move from here and there in space in a matter of a moment just by techniques that are natural to them just as natural to them as an elementary chemistry uh, or physics uh, classroom. Okay, I think enough said on that. Who's next? Is it Song? Yes. <laughs> Is this a good time to talk about living conditions as they relate to a monastery? Good a time as any. Living conditions as they relate as a monastery. Well, goodness, if you're watching this tenth tape, is it? This tenth session? You've seen nine times already this little scroll that came up on the end of our show and said something about total overcomers, anonymous, monastery, non-denominational, and you could think, what is that? And uh, I believe we've discussed that we do not have a physical place someplace as a monastery where we can go and where we have protection and seclusion. It's not that easy. Now, I'm not sure we wouldn't try to take advantage of it for as long as we were capable of taking advantage of it if one existed, but we, we don't. Therefore, our monastery is wherever we are whatever numbers that there are of our classroom in that situation, living as monastics and applying all the lessons, staying in close touch and receiving instruction. And believe it or not, the design that has been given to us, the help that T receives in the, and feeds to me is just unbelievable how appropriate it can be applied to the conditions that we have existed in that allowed us to at times be together, at times to be separate, at times to be in several units. And even though we have a hard time imagining how it might work if, say, many of you uh, who watch these tapes end up choosing your own monastic life, it's hard for us to imagine how that could be carried out, you know, how it could be put into motion, and yet we know that if, it's, if it is right, it, the plan's already been set, and it probably has many options and possible roads that it could take, depending upon the numbers and the all kinds of conditions that aren't really our task yet. And, but we can't predetermine that this can't happen, and we can't imagine how it's going to happen. If we've received instruction to make these tapes, to do these sessions, and to put them out, then what's the process? We do a step at a time, and then we get new instruction. And therefore, we trust, because everything else has worked out as we trusted it. We trust that it would all work out for you. It would require your trust. And we know that if this reaches that point, that it will work to the degree that they choose to continue to do it and that it would work to the satisfaction. If you are sincerely seeking our Father's kingdom, and certainly we are permitted to serve in the capacity of helping you get there, then I can't imagine that our Father wouldn't 
say, take advantage of the opportunity and say, well, I have these representatives there that are doing that process of change, and here are some that we gave them instruction to be in contact with and give them information on how to get from here to there. So I certainly wouldn't leave them if they are serious and if they have that potential. And so we believe the likelihood is there for you. And but whether or not it materializes is still dependent upon you, whether the need will exist, and it, it will only exist if you respond. Each step of closeness that we have is determined by how we respond to what is given to us, whether it's a lesson or restraint or getting rid of our own mind. It's how we respond that pleases or displeases our Father. It's not because we, uh, you know, make a better cake batter or that we can drive, we're a better driver in an automobile or we, even though we try to do all those things to the best of our ability, but things that could be done in the human kingdom, uh, having a better brain that, what humans would call a better brain, uh, doesn't necessarily make us a better responder. It's our yielding, our someone who wants to constantly not be pre, uh, uh, preoccupied with how I want to serve and what I want to do, but someone who says, if I'm not getting assignments, then it's in order to give me a chance to let the information that I've been given to mature, and I'll stay alert and keen and do all the things that are assigned to me as best I can, and if those seem to be thin, then, then it's my test of patience because I have to trust what has been given to me from our Father's kingdom, and I will be patient, and it's their will that I want. Now, if I respond that way, then that's my response to that situation. And I'm always graded on my response, not my proficiency or my skill as far as tasks. It's how we perform the task and how we perform, if, even if we don't get a task, therefore it's our response to the lessons that are given to us are that sometimes even appear the lessons that aren't given to us are still a situation that invites our response. All right, check. What's next on our list? Well, shall we talk more about physical addictions and habits? Yes, we have to get to that topic, so mm -hmm. we might as well. What's, what's first on your little list of physical addictions and habits? Well, um, there's drugs, alcohol, and cigarettes. Okay, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. Uh, needless to say, there's no place in this classroom or in an overcoming process for things that would change our perception or alter our consciousness or uh, even though I don't, it's probably on one of those tapes that I'm still relating to that we have, have uh, retaped. The reference to, at times, even instruction in the classroom might have been to accompany some experiment or some consuming that we have done. Say we're having something that humans would identify as Italian food and we might get on the menu uh, one ounce of a certain kind of wine uh, or two ounces. Uh, because we've had that experience. We've had one ounce to see if it affected us or if we were slightly affected, did we let it lower our vibrations or did we fight through it and, and not be affected it by it? Now, it doesn't mean we were getting instructions to be conditioned because we're going to start introducing alcohol into the diet and we're going to start upping it <laughs> and therefore be able to handle it more and more. No. But the, the principle there is that it's not that alcohol is taboo, it's that alcohol is an interference. It doesn't work. But also the lesson is there that sometimes certain dosages of things uh, are very, very important. A certain dosage might act as a plus, even though it might for the moment seem to possibly be a negative. Any who have worked in chemistry as it related to medicine certainly knows that a a uh, wrong dosage of, of a medicine can kill you. Uh, to the other extreme, it will have maybe no effect. 
And yet the right dosage can be the thing that can help you very much. Now, in the human world, some of those dosages are in question because they might help one thing but then cause certain side effects that would be difficult. As lessons are given to us in our Father's kingdom, the dosages that we would receive are examined and we may not see that dosage again. We may not even see that item again, but we're trying to help you understand how important dosages are even in what we consume, whether it's the amount of broccoli we consume or the, the amount of uh, wheat items that we would consume or the or vegetable juice or whatever we might consume. There is no this is right to consume and this is wrong to consume. I imagine there are certain things that are wrong. I can't imagine there would ever be any justification in our classroom to consume marijuana or morphine or heroin or certainly mind-altering drugs or things that would pretty obviously be only designed to alter our state of consciousness. But. Uh, it's important to understand that dosages are important and that we're not to consume things that would do any significant danger to us and we don't receive instruction to do that. Uh, even though we have, we learn lessons about over-consuming and under-consuming and that's why we've been put through all kinds of tests including water fasts and juice fasts and uh, strict vegetarian where just only vegetables for a long period of time and then vegetables and fruits and then just fruits only for a period of time. We've been through all these things and, and we've learned lessons at each one of them and we learn what serves as maybe a cleaner fuel, what might last a little longer. And it's funny that in a lot of our testing at times we've seen like we needed sweets. I don't know if it's uh, a type of a brain food that we need certain types of sweets. Sometimes the Fruits will uh, satisfy for that. But we learned that the, the health food route doesn't always jive with the instructions that we get, though it does jive to some extent for certain periods of time. But don't forget, uh, the name of our game is Capital Neon Light Flexible. Therefore, we, we are put through things again and again and again that because we don't want to get hooked on something new or decide in our own mind this is the right thing we've got to stick to. As soon as we do that, then we get instruction to stop it and we go to something else. And we're so confused because we thought, boy, that was, we thought that was really the best fuel that we could get. But certainly tobacco doesn't seem to have any place as uh, in smoking or, or chewing or in any other form that I'm aware of. Alcohol, as we've said, would only be dosage of very light in certain circumstances, maybe as it's in given instruction to test us or see how we would respond. Not that we see anything wrong with sometimes getting instruction to use it as a flavoring and something that we might be uh, baking. And then I think we've covered pretty much the drugs, how they would be inappropriate. But in a sense, we, when we have instruction to receive uh, certain herbs for certain uh, symptoms that we might have, or even aspirin, uh, in a sense, we're taking certain low dosages of things that might help us with a particular symptom uh, as a Band-Aid. It's what the world has become, certainly, and we've discussed how those, those food items, those fruits and vegetables, uh, the grains and nuts and seeds and so forth, what they are now is nothing of what they were 6,000 years ago at the beginning of this age, and they've been so uh, uh, mistreated, and they've lost their nutrition, and they've, we've uh, altered them genetically so to make them grow faster, so we can get them to the market faster, and we make them prettier, and we, we uh, put them through certain uh, things so that they won't spoil, and in the process we put things in them we don't want, and, and we take nutrition out, and so we can't go back theoretically and just consume what was in the Garden of Eden because we don't have those fruits any longer, even though some of those fruit items might seem to be here, but they don't have that value. And then it's so hard to find the good ones, and even the good ones aren't good enough this day and time. They're so lacking. Even though we use them, we keep fruits and vegetables relatively high in our diet fairly consistently, but at times we don't just to see if it matters to us, if it's going to alter 
uh, our condition, or we're going to override it. We'll be put to test to override it. This is just helping you understand some of the principles as instructions come down as it relates to our disciplines and things that we might consume. What's next on uh, that list, Song? Well, we talked, uh, I think we mentioned uh, the coffee syndrome. We were wondering about that, and then also uh, uh, what is really satisfying? How do we define what's satisfying to the vehicle? Okay, the, uh, <clears throat> the thing we need to understand about coffee, for example, is that coffee is certainly so unnecessary to us and such a common habit of the human kingdom, then we could pretty much guess that it would be removed from our diet because we, we don't want for things to trigger old habits. If we don't need it, then we... But we might use it in, uh, uh, here again in flavoring uh, certain things. It's not that coffee is taboo and it's nicks and you're going to go to hell if you drink a cup of coffee. But if it's some habit that we had, then why would we get instruction to do it? And if it was a bigger habit and it covered more people in, the, in any given classroom, then it would be more likely not to reappear in our menu, even though it has appeared as flavoring a time or two. There's another little funny influence that goes with coffee and also with tea, is that a lot of people get into a mindset of, you know, I can remember in our early campground in Wyoming where some went around with their coffee cup or their teacup almost as if it was an extension of their hand. And uh, they would in the morning have that and say, well, you know, this is, this is what I'm, uh, this is just me. I just, I can't wake up. I'm a, I'm a night person. I'm not a morning person. I need my cup of coffee or I need my tea. And that's all you need to say to the next level for it not to be a part of your consuming or your experiment or, because uh, if, if you need it, then you're limited. And if you're a night person, you're limited. So, now at times we have had teas. We've had, even back in the campground, we'd have iced tea because it didn't seem that people were that hooked on the having to have it all the time. And pop we did away with for a while and then it came back and, but we would try to handle it in a careful way so that people didn't feel like they had to have it and identify with it. And, but all this came as instruction as to how often to put it in and how much to put it in, and, and it became an important test for, to some, each time one item was a test for one individual or two or five or ten, it also then was not a test for others who it didn't matter to. Anytime it doesn't matter to, then you have flexibility, and that's the reason these various lessons are given to us, so that we don't need them. We know that we can survive without them, and if we have them, we're not going to get hooked on them. And if we begin to want them on a regular basis, we're in danger of being hooked on them. So that's pretty much what we could count then on losing if we began to expect it and want it or feel the need of it. Because we don't need anything. We need one thing. We need our Father's kingdom and the relationship to it that he has given to us and the lessons that he gives to us in order to get closer to him so that we can become rightful heirs, rightful heirs as children in his kingdom. What's next, Jack? Well, I'm not sure if you, if you feel like you touched enough on um, redefining satisfying consuming. No, I didn't, and I'm glad you brought it up. Satisfying consuming, I think we measure satisfying more by does the fuel work? And I, probably we would say it's even more satisfying in some ways if it doesn't take a whole lot of that fuel, even though we've gone through experimentation and consuming where we would consume a whole lot of certain fuel in order to get the nutrients of it. Like we said that the fruits and vegetables have become so depleted. The vegetables probably even more so than the fruits. And I remember when we were just having vegetables, it seemed like we'd just have massive <laughs> amounts of vegetables before we would be sustained because it would move through us so quickly and our energy didn't seem to quite hold up and our appetite not quite uh, satisfied. So it seems that the pattern has kind of been what works as a fuel. It has the energy we want without, now here we're careful about certain things that we consume. For example, if we're consuming meat products, we try to get meat products that don't have hormones in them because we don't want to take the chance on ingesting those hormones having some effect on our hormones and have us deal with certain things that 
we don't feel the need of dealing with. So that's a consideration in all items. We don't want to deal with something that would alter our consciousness. We don't want to deal with certain hormones. Or, so we very carefully, as we get these instructions, feel that the consideration is partially how would it affect us and our chemistry, since we are overcomers. But we are interested in the fuel that would sustain us. Now, if we have different, if we vibrated at a different level, to use one kind of terminology, or we participate in different behavior than the average human out there, then we can have a lot more, what we would call, more refined or less dense or less animal type consuming, because we don't vibrate on that level. We don't have that behavior. But we still, uh, it doesn't mean that muscle has gone out. We still need a certain amount of muscle, so we consume things that would feed the muscle and from time to time consume certain muscles. We don't have this idea, and this gets into another whole topic, which might just easily shut this whole topic off and we'll come back to it. But I'm sure that the question of some of you out there who are listening to us and thought that on your path of enlightenment that it was so valuable to become a strict vegetarian or, or maybe from your point of view of animal rights that why, how could we justify consuming animals at all at any given time? And we had to deal with those same questions when it became instruction for, we, for us to consume those items. And then the more we realized that we can't question that instruction any more than when the Lord gave Moses certain instructions to go and kill the fatted calf in celebration for something uh, in his relationship with those individuals. I mean, th that was an instruction, and they did it. And probably they were put to the test because that fatted calf was such a precious possession to them that they hated to do it in that way. They probably would have rather had the old cow, but our, our father doesn't do what we want. He would rather do, I mean, he, he lets us be fed by our own desires if we're willing to have them satisfied by the wrong side of the fence or the, the kingdom or corporation that is not of his kingdom. But we can't question those things. We can't tell Jesus and his disciples that they were wrong if they were wearing sandals that were made of leather or if some of their outer garments had some animal product in it. Uh, even though we have to give a certain amount of respect to humans who have that mindset. But when they do have that mindset, they're concerned with death of the vehicle. And this is where we get into a thing that we're concerned with the death of the soul. And we're on a lesson plan in overcoming the world that has all kinds of elements in it that put us to the question and to the test that previously we might have thought if we had gotten knowledge about and we wouldn't ever need animal products again. We wouldn't wear them and we wouldn't need to consume them. And then we get instruction to do it and we say, well, it, at this point, does that mean I turn away from my teacher? I turn away, and I'm, I can't go any further. I'm not going to do that. And frequently, that was the reason the test was given. And some could, at that point, turn away, and it would mean that much to them. I mean, is it worth it? Uh, is it worth it? When it's obvious, I mean, did Jesus not even, when he returned to them, after having risen from the tomb, and he ate, what, he ate a piece of fish? And honeycomb. And he had to multiply fish in order to give it to them. Oops, animal products. How do we deal with that if we thought it was spiritual advancement? Don't forget that's counterfeit. If you're following instructions, you have to examine is this instruction, is this a representative? And if you don't know, then what do you do? You say to the Most High God, you say, if this is right for me, help me to know it because I am willing to go a step further. I want your will, not mine. I don't want to be restricted by my preconceived notions of what is moral or what is the issue here as far as animal rights or whether or not I should consume any animal products. It's true that certain animal products give us difficulties in other ways. We find that we have more difficulties probably with milk products 
at times, even though we get instructions to use them in this way or use them in that way, and we have to deal with the problems. But, and so we can never really wipe them out, but we've learned that we, for the most part, we seem to reduce them and might use nut milks or other things because of the vehicle's response to those things. And we do take into account each individual's vehicle's response, and we take that then as I receive it from the classroom or the sections of the classroom, as I receive it, then I take it to my older member and say, what do we do about this? And then I wait for an answer of what to do about it and how to approach the next lesson as far as symptoms of the vehicles and what we might consume and the effect that it might have upon our vehicles. There's nothing in the human kingdom that, since our Father's kingdom, does not need those items to consume. Our Father has a different kind of fuel, doesn't need that fuel. Therefore, if we're getting into our Father's kingdom, and the closer and closer and closer we get, the more human-designed fuel and animals of this Earth's age, the more those consuming items become less compatible to our vehicles. And we have to try to override that incompatibility. And therefore, it does us a lot of good. We can see why they have switched us from this to this to this to this, because they all seem to have some degree of ill effect on us. And then we counter that with not having too much of this and moving on to that and whatever they give us an instruction. But this might help you understand a little bit of how they relate to us and some of the tests that we're put to in their relationship to us concerning consuming. What's next? Check. Well, I um, didn't know if you'd like to talk about the psychological addictions and habits like negativity, moodiness, judge, judging others, that type of Yes, it's valuable that we talk about those issues because they are as important, I could say easily, if not more important, but all of these I don't know how to weigh which ones are more important. Negativity, moodiness. Negativity, listening to anything that could discourage me in this task of overcoming. Or when I receive instruction not to listen to certain things and I continue to listen to, then in my secret I am holding an ace in the hole or whatever you want to call it. I'm secretly testing my teachers. You're not really, even though this is a teacher speaking, you're not really testing the teachers. You're really at that moment, for that duration, you're saying, I'm going to put the whole kingdom of heaven on trial as it relates to the one that you have assigned for me. Because I'm going to let that one you've assigned to me be the object of my test or my trial. If, because if, if they say, if you do this and this, then it can help you not accept that negativity. But I continue to listen to negativity that could overcome me, then I'm not breaking that habit. I am choosing to continue to listen to doubt or discouragement because Lucifer comes in and says things like, this isn't really what you want to do. Why don't you go out and serve the humans in this way or that way? Which, and he can say, you can, you can see something accomplished with your time. Where this, you're off isolated and who can be uh, positively affected by this isolation? How much good are you doing in the human kingdom? Are you really helping them that much? That's because Lucy doesn't, Lucifer doesn't understand what you're doing for the human kingdom. As this classroom goes up a notch, the, it pulls the whole rest of that human kingdom closer and tests them that much more to give them an opportunity to move up. But he, he forgets that because he wants, he needs members. He also does not want us to succeed at overcoming. So it is par for the course. It is on every student's mind to fight off negativity, discouragement, things that would put us down as individuals. And that discouragement, if we listen to it, it, it also becomes moodiness. For the time we're not listening to it, then we might be happy. And for the time we are listening to it, then we're more shy and more pulled away and our face is dragging and our ability to serve is, is interfered with because of our countenance and everyone around us can read what's going on in our countenance and they try to help us out of it and we insist that it's not happening even though they can tell us that 
they know that it is happening. And so then they can't try to help us beyond trying to offer it to us for a while. And because then we, we're forcing someone to do something that they don't want to do. So then the next question might say, are you, are you sure you want to be here? Because you're unhappy. I'm not sure you want to be here. And then at that point you have to say, whoops, am I really unhappy? Then maybe I shouldn't be here. And that opens the door that much bigger to Satan's argument and tests us. Because at that time we've got an opportune time to leave and drop all this and go and tend to what he says is more significant for us. And then we get right down to the nitty gritty and we have to re-examine, is this everything we were looking for? Are we going to gamble in losing it? Are we going to take a chance in losing it in order to go do the things that we used to do or that maybe we feel like we haven't really had a chance to do in the world that other humans do that can certainly be benefactory or benefic to humans for a period of time for that degree of development for the individual that is doing it. So the whole process of overcoming is testing. Negativity is a major item we have to deal with. Negative thinking, listening to things of discouragement that would put us down. Moodiness and what was your... But there was judging yourself and, I mean, judging others as well as degrading yourself. Goodness. Judge that you be not judged. I mean, if I am, if it is true that my Heavenly Father exists, and if he has appointed my older member as my older member, and if I am a younger member to that older member, and thereby an older member to you, if that is true and you misjudge me, then only he has the right to judge you by, or have you judged yourself by judging? Who really judged, though? I'm afraid that what I believe the truth is that you at that point have not misjudged us. You have listened to misjudgment from those who are such aggressors in feeding you misinformation, and then you have joined their forces in misjudging. It's very important. It's just as important to you that you not misjudge your own overcoming, your own capacity at overcoming. Not let influences or thoughts of misinformation pull you down and discourage you because that happens again and again. Your performance can be poor and your response can be poor and you can say, I'm, I'm never going to get this. I'm, others are getting it and they're, they're, I can see them moving up and, and I'm not moving up. And, it's very easy to listen to negativity. And it's difficult to turn a negative into a positive. But we have a, we have a plan that was given to us, and it says, if I will expose anything that is of that wrong household, acknowledge it and expose it, it can be taken from me. I can be free of it. I can be not responsible for it. If I listen to negativity in overcoming, I'm sinning. I am doing something against my father's house. I am separating from my father's house and the appointee that he has designated. And that sin itself has to be taken from me. Another note taken by his representative. It says, just acknowledge that what you were doing is self-destructive to you and acknowledge what it was. and." We'll get past it. Don't worry about it. Forget it. It's gone. It doesn't exist. Then we have to, the step we talked about the other day, which is very hard to do, we have to drop it. We have to forget it if we expect to eradicate it. Lucifer does not want us to forget anything negative. Even if we make progress and make progress, he wants us to remember it. He will even say, it'll do you good to remember those things as lessons so that you will say, I learned this lesson. It doesn't. When you acknowledge it and you submit it and you say, I want to go on. That's the same thing as asking for forgiveness. I want to go on. Here it was. This was wrong. I can see how it was destructive to me. I don't want it. I want to go on. Will you accept me still as a student? Will the next level accept me? Because all your teacher can say was, well, 
I pray to God to go ask my older member. <laughs> and we'll see. And that usually doesn't take much time. Sometimes on the spot, the older member can speak through the vessel and say, it's done. It's behind you. It's gone. You can forget about it. And we can start afresh. And if you do that, if you refuse to remember it again, and you take a major step forward, then that step forward will be then a part of your new structure. But if you remember it, you can slip easily back into it. You will remind yourself of that position, and you will become that in, you will remain in that condition as long as you, as that's where you put yourself. If you refuse to put yourself there, then you're ready for the next step. And a new position and a new person. Each step can be a new person. Each time you get rid of something, it's a brand new person. Now, it's up to each class member to each time not remember their fellow class member from where their fellow class member was. They've got to make that adjustment. They've got to give them credit for change. If they want to help them change, they've got to give them credit for change and not hold anything against them for what, where they were. But the, most, the easiest way for your class members to accept that is when they see in you that you have made that change. And it, not that they have to wait. It's their responsibility to give you credit for that change. It's your responsibility to demonstrate that that change has taken place. And these are basic elements in overcoming. Who's next? Are you next, Song? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Did we want to talk a little bit about deceit and dishonesty? I think you've mentioned it's like a neon light in the next kingdom level. It's, uh, it's such a festered boil. It's so, it's, uh, it, few things could be equal to it. It's so bad to be deceitful and to be dishonest. Because it, it's uh, all for the time that you are deceitful on any little item, no matter how minute it is, it increases. Because first it might have just been that item. Then another item is added of dishonesty. Then another item is added, I'm not keeping my slate clean as I promised that I would. And items continue to mount because those forces are saying, it's not that important. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to be embarrassed by uh, recognizing that this was negative. This was beneath you to do that thing, and you want to expose it. Exposure is a wonderful thing. It's like getting relief. But if influences say, don't expose, hold it, then you immediately become dishonest, deceitful, and difficult things mount. When difficult things mount, what does it take to get me to the next step? An equally more difficult test. I can't move forward if I am permitting an indebtedness to occur without something just as equally difficult. The step was, if I had done it, the step up would have been a very little one if I had exposed it at the time that we had instruction to expose it and I moved up, it wouldn't have been that much difficult, that much difficulty. But as the longer I delay it and the more things that begin to mount because I'm getting further and further in my privacy and my putting it off and my not doing the things that were given to me to do, then in order to move from there to here, it becomes super tough and major. It's hard then to prove at that point to those who help your older members, those of our Father's kingdom in their daily activities. They do a lot of this work that the teachers certainly don't do. And they will have things occur to you that will put you in the position of that test. I mean, most of the work happens from them. In the classroom situation, what happens with the teachers is almost small in comparison to what members of our Father's Kingdom literally are doing for you and the things that they subject you to and the circumstances you're put in that permit you the opportunity to move ahead and conquer. 
Now this, of course, it gets into another issue, and that's some of the activities of Our Father's Kingdom, which we'll talk about when we get to that question. I'm going to try not to make that jump. Who's next, or did we not finish that one? Well, I think there are a few other things like uh, gossip and confidentiality and familiarity. I didn't know if you wanted to uh, talk about those things. Okay, well, these are really deadly sins. These are really negative things that can breed just as much trouble as dishonesty and deceit. You said gossip and you said confidentiality. Confidenti confidentiality to me is the same thing as deceit. It's, uh, it's I'm finding someone else to join me in my deceit because if I'm entering into something with someone else that I wouldn't enter into with my teacher or other members of the class, then I'm creating a circum an unnatural circumstance there. It's, l it's certainly less than objective or more than objective, whichever way you want to look at it. And it becomes a relationship that was not an assignment. Therefore, I have gone against the instruction. I am no longer a flexible crew member that is objective. I am giving in to the desire of the flesh or the influences that are that are triggering that flesh by wanting some kind of special relationship. I've found somebody who can really be a partner to me. We can have our little confidentialities and our little gossip. That makes the partnership absolutely impossible and deadly to both individuals if they participate in it until they learn how not to participate in it. So we talked about gossip, confidentiality, and familiarity. familiarity. Uh, familiarity is pretty much the same thing, except uh, a lot of times um, familiarity is still a withdrawal symptom from needing uh, a close attachment with another individual. And the it's I know it sounds tough, and Lucy makes this sound absolutely ridiculous when it comes out our mouths. But our Father's kingdom says, if you're going to overcome this world and come into my kingdom, you're going to be only familiar with one thing, and that's my kingdom. You're only going to love one thing, that's my kingdom. As far as physical familiarity with anyone, the only familiarity you can have, the only confidant you can have, the only one you can talk to about things that you might want to talk to, are your check partners within procedures and your older member, that that's the way we have designed it. And if you try to change those, then to that degree you are going against the lesson plan. And you have to mistrust the lesson plan to participate in those things. Now, when we don't know that we're going against the lesson plan, the methods that they give us always help it surface that we uh, have done something that we didn't know we were doing it when we did it. And then it becomes another kind of test. Can I take it when it's... Can I take criticism? Or can I have it brought to my attention? Or do I want to say, oh no, you're taking me from a long, wrong level? Because a test that comes to us so frequently is, if I'm really flexible, then I take what is given to me as correction and believe it and apply it. And it's, it's very important that you understand something here, and that is, even if it was misinformation, even if it didn't apply, the technique works of examining it and saying, well, I must have not seen what was going on here. In other words, I want to take the blame. I want to say, you're right, even though influences in my brain might say, I wasn't, it was the other person who was wrong here. But if I say, I must have been doing something wrong or you wouldn't have responded the way you did or the others wouldn't have seen me in that light. So if I take the blame then and assume it as something that I did wrong, then I stand on the path of eliminating whatever it was that I did because of my willingness to examine it and what harm would come to me even if I had not been wrong. But if I defend myself, then I'm taking more than a 50-50 chance that I was not being flexible. I was be choosing to believe my own mind instead of the mind that was being given to me by, through my teachers and through my helpers and through my partnerships. 
believe it or not, none of the students like to hurt each other. I mean, they don't like, so why would somebody come and accuse you of something because they like to hurt you? I mean, heavens, if they aren't past that by now, they, I don't know where they are. They, uh, frequently, we have to fuss at a partner for not helping a partner because a partner will say, the partner I have just, they don't bring up things to me. I don't feel like I'm making any progress. And so we confront the partner and they say, well, I just hate to bring it up because it, uh, it might be difficult for them to deal with. You're not helping someone if they don't bring it up. If they've solicited help, if they said, would you please bring it up? I want to know about it. And they say, well, but I don't want the confrontation. Well, then you're, you're no good to them. You can't really help them in that circumstance. So it's very important that we be willing to help them. We be willing when we say to them that you might have been doing this behavior or that one and it might be appropriate, we preface it by saying, I could be wrong. I could be completely off base by what I see. But the thought did occur to me and, and we have procedure when the thought does occur to us to bring it up. And so if the shoe fits, wear it. If it doesn't, I'm sure glad because I don't I don't like to bring things up. And it works. And of course, it can put the person to test, and they can say, how outrageous for you to bring that. Or they can say, goodness, I wasn't aware of that. I'll examine it, and I'll, I'll try to apply it. And the neat thing is that if we can shift into the gear of assuming they were right, or it wouldn't have been brought to our attention, 99 times out of 100, we'll find out exactly how they were right and how we were guilty. It wasn't, it didn't mean anything. It wasn't any big deal. The most important thing was for us to become flexible, for us to examine it. And if we take the blame, what harm has happened if it didn't, if the shoe didn't fit? Or do we feel embarrassed? Are we too concerned about being embarrassed by it? We have to overcome that too. That's just another thing we have to overcome. So. Boy, we're getting into the nitty-gritty. This is part of what goes on every day in the classroom again and again. So I felt that it would be only fair to you to see. What are we doing? We're trying to shorten your days. We're trying to help you not enter a possible classroom situation with, in your own monastery, only to say, boy, if I'd known that was going to happen, I never would have started this. There's that 10-second card, and we'll see you in our next session.